Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Lecture. My name is Harry Helling. I'm the Executive Director here at the Birch Aquarium. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Dan Cardamill. Dan holds a research appointment here at Scripps in the Marine Bio Biology Research Division. He earned his bachelor's degree in biology from State University at New York, his master's in marine biology from California State University, Long Beach, and his PhD here at Scripps. Dan has a very diverse background. He um, is a shark biologist. He specializes in movement patterns, um, ecology, and fisheries of sharks, and especially the thresher shark um, here uh, in, off California waters and in Baja, California. Dan is also an environmental consultant. Some of you have heard him speak. Um, he specializes in the impact of seawater desalinization. And of course, important to the story and important to understand Dan, and per my notes, Dan is a drummer who loves the conga drums and plays a whole variety of instruments and has for over 30 years. Um, Dan was a PhD student and part of this story, he was a doctoral scholar under Jeffrey B. Graham. So one of the first, one of his students, and therefore that qualifies him like the lecture series, Dan, along with his research, he's part of Jeffrey B. Graham legacy here at Scripps, part of what we're celebrating here this evening. For this evening's topic, Dan has spent the last, the better part of the past decade photographing Baja California's untamed wilderness, particularly the Pacific Coast region where he conducts research to protect migrating sharks from overfishing. His new book, Baja's Wild Side, is available here this evening, and he'll be around um, after the presentation to sign the program. As well, some of his prints are set up by the door here. I hope you take the time on the way out to um, to really look at those, they're very special. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dan, Baja's Wild Side, Shark Research and Conservation Photography in Baja, California. Please help me welcome Dan. Thank you, thank you very much. It's great to see everybody here. This is actually a um, very special uh, night for me because it's the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Lecture. And uh, you know, as Harry mentioned, I was one of Jeff's last students um, and um, got to know Jeff very well. Um, Jeff, and in fact, this story actually begins with Jeff, so why don't we, why don't we jump right in? Uh, Jeff is the first slide. Uh, the, the talk you're gonna hear tonight is um, a bit of an adventure story. It's, uh, it starts with sharks, in California waters, then we migrate south into Baja and have an adventure in photography and rock art and all kinds of things. But the story really starts in 2004 with Dr. Jeff Graham. Um, as many of you know, Jeff uh, is one of the, the big names in marine biology. Um, he's most known as a fish physiologist. Uh, but in the last 10 years or so of his time at Scripps, he became really interested in shark research, and that's how I got into his lab. Um, Jeff was, um, actually had a grant to, do, uh, to study the movement patterns of a particular species of open ocean shark. And I had just gotten out of my master's degree, and I was looking for a PhD program. And I had experience tracking the movement patterns of open ocean fishes, so it was a, it was a nice fit. I went to meet Jeff. He invited me to join his lab, and uh, you know, when a guy like Jeff Graham asks you to join his lab for a funded project at Scripps, you don't even think twice. You just you hope he doesn't change his mind. Uh, and one last thing that I want to mention about Jeff while we're on the subject is uh, some people don't know about this this about Jeff, but Jeff was actually an incredible artist as well. His favorite medium was painting, and he has got a lot of beautiful paintings. Um, so I think Jeff would have gotten a kick out of this talk in that it is kind of an intersection in the worlds of sharks and art. Now, the shark that Dr. Graham had funding to study was a species called the common thresher. So some of you are familiar with the common thresher. Has anybody ever heard of the common thresher shark? A lot of people, okay? It's actually quite a common local shark, as the name would imply. They're common in worldwide in cooler waters, and they're actually quite a large shark. Uh, they can get up to about 20 feet in length. And the, the thing that's really unique and interesting about the thresher shark, if you look at this shark here on the screen, is that the tail 
of the animal is about the same length as the rest of its body. Uh, so it uses that tail to stun its prey. Even though it's such a large shark, it feeds primarily on very small things, anchovies and sardines that are a few inches long, and it will herd them into a little ball, stun them with its tail, and then come back around and eat the dead, dismembered, and the wounded, <laughs> to put it dramatically. Uh, so it's a really interesting animal. And Jeff and I had funding to study the movement patterns of this shark. So what does that mean? In other words, where does the shark go? We were trying to learn about its biology from figuring out where it goes. Uh, what depths does it inhabit? What, what uh, parts of the sea does it live in? And so on. And there's, a, at the time, the best way to study the movement patterns of a fish like the shark was through a technology called acoustic telemetry. So as you'll see in this, in this figure here, there's a shark with an acoustic telemetry tag on its dorsal fin. Now these are tags that you put on a shark, and the tags have sensors that measure various uh, things like depth, temperature, it tells you where the shark is, measures light levels, and all sorts of oceanographic parameters that we can use to learn about the shark's habitat. And the reason they're called acoustic tags is because once they've measured those parameters, they then uh, send those parameters out into the ocean in the form of a sound wave. So you have to actually intercept that sound wave, and by homing in on the sound wave, you can follow the shark around the ocean. So the way that's done is that we're on a research vessel. Here's the vessel. Here's my friend Nick Wegner, who's out there in the, uh, in the crowd. Uh, he's on the tracking vessel. We, we've let a shark go with a tag, and underneath the boat is this instrument called a hydrophone. It's like an underwater microphone, and using that hydrophone, you can hone in on the shark's signal and follow it around the ocean. So the first couple of years I was at Scripps, Nick and I and, and several other graduate students at the time uh, spent a lot of time out on the water fishing. We would do a lot of 12-hour days fishing, and I believe that our success rate in catching threshers was about, uh, I don't know, maybe a half a thresher per day, which actually isn't that bad. Now, thresher sharks are not like other sharks that which bite the lure. If you're trying to catch a thresher shark, the thresher shark uses its tail to slap the, t the lure, and so it usually comes in tail first. And as we're trying to um, subdue the shark in order to tag it, we just want to tire it out a little bit so that we can keep it by the side of the boat. What we found out is that by just holding the shark by its tail out of the water, it'll tire out pretty quickly. And then you can pretty much have your way with it. Uh, so here's the shark. He's getting tuckered out. It takes about five minutes of holding him out, the, out of the water for this to happen. Then the shark is tired. We just keep him by the side of the boat and we insert the electronic tag into his dorsal fin. Now, once the shark has been tagged, we measure it, and uh, the next thing that we do is take the hook out of the water, uh, the hook out of the shark's mouth. That part is a little sketchy, as you can see here, but I let Nick do that part usually. So now the shark has uh, been released. It swims away. You can see the tag here on its dorsal fin. The shark promptly forgets the entire incident. Uh, meanwhile, our work has just begun because we have to follow the shark for about 50 to 75 hours to collect data from the tag. So this is our research vessel. Um, you can see us on the boat uh, doing the tracking. Uh, generally, there's just two of us doing this. So one person is on this piece of machinery collecting all the data. Uh, meanwhile, the other person is trying to catch a, c a couple of winks because it's really exhausting. And there's our luxury accommodations in the bottom of the boat. So as I said, that typically takes place for about 50 to 70 hours or so. And then usually when we run out of gas and food and we start hallucinating from lack of sleep, we give up and try it again another day. Uh, so the first couple of years, we tagged and tracked a lot of really big sharks. And then we realized, well, you know, we need to track and tag the little baby sharks, too, because we're never going to get an idea of what the entire life cycle of this shark is unless we do that. So we actually spent some time, a couple of years tracking juvenile threshers. So these are real small sharks. Juvenile threshers are born at a size of about a meter and a half, 
um, which is about this, the total length of this one, including the tail. So um, substantially less impressive uh, than the, the big ones, but very cute. And uh, I believe that probably in about four or five years of tagging and tracking threshers, we tagged electronically about 100, 110 sharks and followed their movement patterns throughout the Southern California waters. So just to give you a quick overview of what we learned about thresher sharks during that time. Uh, and that is as follows. Turns out that thresher sharks, um, when they're newborn and very young, in fact, for the first two or three years of their lives, they like to live in the shallow inshore waters over the continental shelf. This is a shelf that extends about two to three miles offshore. And it's never gets deeper than a couple of hundred meters at most, or not even that deep, about 100 meters. That actually happens to be a very important habitat for juvenile threshers, and they use that as what's called a nursery area. So a nursery area for sharks is a particular place where sharks spend the first couple of years of their lives that provides them with plenty of prey, lots of schools of sardine and anchovy over the continental shelf, but probably more important is the fact that there are much less predators in the inshore waters. If you've been uh, swimming around off the beach, you probably haven't seen a lot of big mako sharks and blue sharks, and that's because, luckily for us, they live farther offshore. So the, the juvenile threshers inhabit the near shore waters, probably mostly as a refuge from these predators. But at a certain size range, those threshers begin to feel pretty safe, and that size range is at about eight feet in length, or 2.5 meters, and at that time, the juvenile threshers will head offshore and start a new phase of their life, their adult phase. And as an adult, they're mostly open ocean sharks living offshore of the continental shelf. So it's a really interesting life cycle. And once these big sharks uh, have their oceanic phase, another thing that happens is that they start doing a lot of deep dives. So as, as opposed to living over the shelf and mostly being near the surface, now they're offshore and making dives to hundreds of meters of depth, probably to increase their prey items and also feed on a lot of these uh, bigger fish that live near the ocean bottom, like uh, flatfish and rockfish. So um, this is, as I said, a very quick overview of the life cycle of thresher sharks and some of what we learned um, over several years of studying those sharks. Um, but one of the things um, that really became obvious towards uh, uh, about three or four years into these studies was that everything that was known about thresher sharks took place in this little area. This is from Santa Barbara to the U.S.-Mexico border, basically Southern California. That's where almost all studies of thresher sharks had taken place. And what we weren't sure about was what does the life cycle of thresher sharks consist of outside of that zone, if in fact they go outside of that zone. It didn't seem like there was a lot going on outside of Southern California. So for the very final chapter of my PhD, I wanted to examine the movements of sharks outside of this range. And there's not just, it's not just a biological question, in fact, it's also a very practical question because as some of you may know, thresher sharks are not just really interesting sharks that have cool tails. They also are a major fishery target. So thresher sharks are actually the largest commercially fished shark fishery uh, on the west coast of the United States. So there's a practical aspect to this. We, in, the, in the United States, we believe that we manage thresher shark fisheries sustainably. In other words, we manage the fishermen and their fishing efforts to the point where we don't think they're taking too many threshers out to overly deplete the population. But if thresher sharks are moving south into Mexican waters and being caught in large numbers, that could completely throw off our calculations and they could be being over-harvested. So this is a question of sustainability. So for the final chapter of my thesis uh, here at Scripps, I wanted to investigate the following question. Do Mexican waters function as a habitat for the common thresher shark? Now, how do you go about doing that, uh, or answering that kind of question? Uh, that's a good question. And the way that I decided to do that after cons consultation with quite a few experts was to do a survey of the artisanal fishing camps of Baja, California. 
Now, the reason I decided to do this is because one way to figure out where a shark is going is to tag them and follow them and do all that stuff that we had been doing. But that's really tough to do s south of the border where you don't have scripts and all the logistics, uh, all the logistical support and everything else. But the really easy way to find out if a shark is inhabiting a particular body of water is to just to look in the nets of fishermen that are fishing for sharks and other fish. And if thresher sharks are being caught in large numbers, guess what? There's thresher sharks there. So I wanted to look at the fishermen of Baja California and find out what they were catching. But it turns out, and I didn't really know this at the time before I got involved, that uh, in Mexico, fishing, particularly shark fishing, is a very different affair than it is here in the United States. Now, in, in the United States, if we were to picture a typical fishing operation, we'd see a marina and a modern day fishing fleet and a bunch of boats docked there and fishermen going in and out. Whereas along the Pacific coast of Baja, California, it's very different. Fishing takes place in what is called artisanal fishing camps. Artisanal meaning small scale, traditional fishing camps. And these are places that are quite remote often. They're places where fishermen live on the beach. They launch their boats off the beach. They go out and fish all day and sometimes for several days and they come back to the beach and camp there. And uh, so that's where everything takes place. And the fact that these camps are, some of them are so remote is one of the main reasons why we didn't know anything about them up to this time. So. We went down there to, with the objective of surveying these artisanal camps. And again, Dr. Jeff Graham comes into play in this story. Jeff introduced me to some colleagues in Mexico that helped me out a lot with this project, in particularly colleagues from CICESE, which is the Oceanographic Institute in Ensenada. And of course, being Jeff, he wasn't uh, satisfied with me doing a small project of uh, just looking at the camps and seeing what they caught. So this became a huge full-blown project where for years we were going down and surveying every single camp to determine what they were catching, the extent of the fishery, how many fishermen there were, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to, um, as we get into this story of the Baja artisanal shark fishermen, I would just like to uh, show you a little bit about the first 10 days of this project because it kind of sets the stage for what was to come. And the first 10 days uh, consisted of me going down to Ensenada to meet with my colleagues there. And uh, I was introduced to a graduate student named Omar Santana. And uh, Omar and I uh, thought up a game plan. We said, let's go and spend 10 days traveling down the, coast of Pacific, uh, down the Pacific coast of Baja, and we'll visit some of these camps, and we'll see if this project is even feasible. Maybe we, can, maybe we can do it, maybe we can't. But So basically, we decided to go, to go on a scouting trip. So Omar and I started in Ensenada. Day one of, this, of our very first day in Baja, we drove down the one paved road that goes down the length of Baja, California, to a fishing camp by the name of Laguna Manuela, where we had been told there was a lot of fishing going on. So in the morning, we left from Ensenada. We arrive close to Laguna Manuela. But once you leave the main paved road, it's about 20 miles of dirt road to get to the actual fishing camp. So we get off the main road. And we have about 20 miles of dirt road to navigate, which takes about an hour because the road's so bad. But as we're traveling down this road, Omar notices that there are a lot of these gray lumps in the desert. I mean, we're in pure desert right now. We're, not, we're still many miles from the ocean. And uh, we didn't know what they were. And the farther, we, the farther we got into the desert, the more of these gray lumps we saw. And so finally, we pull over to investigate. And it, what it turned out to be is a, a, an enormous expanse of mummified shark carcasses and skulls that were scattered throughout many square miles of desert. And they were in a, a highly preserved state because of the extreme heat and dryness of the region. Uh, so the very first thing I saw on my first day in Baja was this field of shark mummies, which was an odd way to start things off. Now, we kept going towards the fishing camp of Laguna Manuela. And once we got there, we discovered the source of the shark mummies, at least the, uh, the pre-mummy stage, which was the fact that fishermen out of Laguna Manuela typically were sending about 20 to 30 boats a day were leaving the, 
leaving the beach and going out to fish for sharks, and they'd come back with a boatload of sharks and rays, as you can see here. Uh, here's a thresher shark, several um, hammerheads, and quite a few stingrays. So we knew right off the bat, between the mummies and the, and the freshly caught specimens, that Laguna Manuela was probably going to figure importantly in our studies of the Baja California shark fisheries. So we camped on the beach that first night in Laguna Manuela, and the next day headed north to visit some more fishing camps. And we, uh, there's quite a few in that region, so it didn't take us long to find the next fishing camp. And as you can see here, we would stop and interview fishermen about the, what they were catching. And so this was my first glimpse of the fishing culture of Baja California. And it was a real eye-opener because uh, I realized that these fishermen were really pretty poor people living in the most meager of circumstances. I mean, the, you, usually living in some sort of plywood shanty or maybe they didn't even have that and they were living in an old ratty tent. Um, but the amazing thing about these people is that no matter where we went, uh, they would always invite us in, into their shanty or into their tent. They'd say, please, come into, let me, ha let me make you some coffee. Or they would uh, give us a bag of freshly caught lobster or uh, a freshly caught halibut. Um, some of the most uh, generous, friendly people I've ever met in my life. And in fact, like many people, or I should say like many marine biologists, I got into the field for the seafood. And <laughs> So this was great, you know. We had some of the best meals of our lives on that first 10-day trip, and Omar had the foresight to bring a few cloves of fresh garlic and some olive oil. So there he is, sauteing lobster tails, and even though we're squatting in the dirt to eat those lobster tails, it was pretty good. Now, one of the next surprises of working in Baja, California, was the fact that we had to traverse some really remote and bad dirt roads in the middle of nowhere to get to where we were going. And uh, if anything happened, we were pretty much on our own out there. So that was a little scary. <laughs> I'll show you a little video of one of the roads we traversed. I, I had the sense to get out of the truck for this little incline and just video, which I thought was kind of fun. And I should mention that this is not off-roading. This is just, th this is the road. <laughs> But that's all kind of the fun of Baja, California. OK, so we're traveling around Baja, California on this 10-day trip, moving up the coast. The next thing that uh, really struck me on this 10-day excursion was that here we are traveling up the Pacific coast. just a few hours south of Southern California, one of the most populated places in the United States, and yet we could drive 10, 20, 30 miles at a clip on the Pacific coast and not see a human, which was just an incredible thing. Not, and not only the isolation, but also the pristineness of the landscape was really striking. And I love the coast. I'm a big coast fan, but I'm an even bigger desert fan. And so uh, what was even more impressive to me than the, these coastal stretches was actually the inland regions. So, which you wouldn't think that we would have much uh, occasion to enter, but the thing is when you're traveling up the coast, a lot of times there's an obstacle. Maybe there's a cliff in the way. So you have to drive inland a couple of hours, up a mountain range, down through a canyon, and come back to the coast. And maybe four hours later, you've actually made a, a four mile dent in your overall trip. As we're driving through some of these inland areas, we encountered for the first time uh, the deserts of central Baja, in particular the valley of the Bujums, Valle de los Sirios as it's called. Um, and that was a real, that really blew my mind because it's one of the most incredibly beautiful places on, on earth. So. We did this 10-day trip, and then we said, okay, we're going to, we're going to do this project. We're, we're going to do it. And we spent several years studying these fishing camps. It turned out that Laguna Manuela, the very first camp we visited, did actually become my main field site. And so I spent a couple of years at least, two or three years, uh, on the beach collecting data from sharks as they were brought in from the fishermen. But the other thing is that remember that this wasn't just a, a study to look at Laguna Manuela, it was a study to document 
and survey all of the artisanal fishing camps. We had discovered that there were 44 of them in the northwestern region of Baja California, which was my study region. And so we had to visit every single one of those periodically to collect data. Now, that as you might imagine, put us in a lot of backcountry travel situations. And we got to see a lot of the peninsula in a very in-depth way that most people will just never be able to do because it's so time consuming and hard to get to. And basically wherever we were at sunset, because we're traveling a lot, that's where we would set up tents and camp for the night and then we'd keep going the next morning. So it became kind of a joke amongst the, the people that were working with us, uh, especially Omar who had to bear the brunt of of my, uh, whatever. Uh, well, the joke was that wherever we went, they would get out and start setting up the tents and do all, doing all the work, doing all the cooking and uh, setting up the campsite and entering data. Meanwhile, I would run out with my tripod and try and get a few pictures while the light was still good because we were in some of the most beautiful places I'd ever seen and I didn't know if we'd ever be there again. And. Uh, this went on for several years, as I say. And around the year 2012, so about five years ago, I got the idea of co compiling all of these images and publishing a photography book of the region. And the reason for this, there was a couple of reasons, uh, but the main reason is that I found out that the Pacific Coast zone of Baja California, particularly Northern Baja California, is imperiled. Um, and the reason it's imperiled is the same reason that uh, wildernesses are, are in peril throughout the world, and that is because of an, an incredible increase in human population. And it wouldn't be uh, that much of an overstatement to say that there's been a population explosion in Baja California in the last hundred years. So census data from 1917 shows, showed about 20,000 humans inhabiting the peninsula. And today there are close to four million. So if you really let those numbers sink in, that's just an incredible increase in human population in this really pristine desert region that doesn't have a lot of resources anyway to support these people. Here we're looking, of course, at Tijuana. And most of this growth, as you might imagine, actually takes place in the border cities near the United States. So. Uh, there's this population explosion and humanity is moving into a lot of the wild places of Baja California and nowhere more so than in our backyard, the Pacific Coast region. So the purpose of this book and this conservation photography project which I embarked upon was simply to increase public awareness of that fact and also to show the uniqueness and the fragility of the Baja wilderness. And so Without further ado, I'll take you on a very quick tour of the region that I worked in. And for the purposes of the book that I ended up um, publishing, I'd split this into four main regions. And so we'll look at those four reasons. The first one is called the Gold Coast. I don't know who named it the Gold Coast, but a lot of people call it the Gold Coast. And the Gold Coast is essentially our backyard. It's the part that's literally right across the border and we could get into a bus and drive down to the Gold Coast and we'd be sipping a margarita in about half an hour from now. It's that close. Uh, because it's so close, you can actually think of the Gold Coast as an extension of Southern California. And in fact, most of the coastline looks very similar to Southern California coastline, with the exception that uh, particularly south of Ensenada, which is the last really big city um, in the north, um, there's a lot of undeveloped land. And because of that, there are still quite a few rare uh, ecosystems, like for example, coastal chaparral, that, are not, that have not yet been impacted by human activities. But what I really uh, like about the Gold Coast is, as much as I enjoy the coastal area of it, what I think is fascinating about the Gold Coast is what you find when you move inland. And again, it's very similar to Southern California. What do we find when we move inland are these uh, large mountain ranges. And it's the same thing in Baja California. When you move inland from the coast, you gain elevation quite rapidly until you're over 10,000 feet high in the Sierra San Pedro Martir. This, with the, what you're looking at here is Picacho del Diablo. That's the highest point on the Baja Peninsula at uh, ten, almost 10,200 feet. 
you know, and there's hundreds of square miles up there of these dense, sprawling pine forests. So it's very reminiscent of something you'd find in the Sierra Nevada, but not something you expect to find in Baja, California. So it's a fascinating place. Uh, and I highly suggest you visit it if you ever get a chance, because there's a paved road all the way to the top and a beautiful campground. It's actually quite easy. Now, as we move south from uh, the High Sierra, we encounter the, the first truly Baja habitat, which is the Valley of the Bujams. In Spanish, it's called Valle de los Sirios. And this is an area which is named after the characteristic tree of the region, which is the Bujum tree here. The Bujum tree is a bizarre tree that kind of looks like a giant skinny upside down carrot that twists itself into all sorts of shapes that are beautiful to look at and sometimes fun to photograph. Uh, so it's an otherworldly place. The other highly characteristic species of uh, plant that that you can't miss when you're in the Valley of the Bujums is the cardon cactus. So you, we've got these enormous fields of cardon cacti that are over 60 feet high and sometimes weigh over 25 tons. So between the Bujums, the cardon cacti, the otherworldly kind of geology of the area, it's really a fascinating place and a place that I fell in love with instantly. Um, but there's a reason for that. It's, it wasn't, it's, just not, it's not just the natural beauty of Baja. It's what is lurking just beneath the surface of that natural beauty. And what I mean by that is that there's not only uh, natural forms that you find in the desert. There are also these man-made structures. Uh, people have been in Baja, California for over 10,000 years. But the Spanish, Europeans, f first came to Baja in the 1500s. And around the, the 1700s or so, they put in uh, major efforts to build a series of missions along the entire peninsula. Many of these missions are still there deep in the desert. Some of them are quite robust and made of quarried stone. Some of them, like this one, are adobe, and they're sl slowly melting back into the desert. But that's only the first layer of history in Baja California. In fact, you could call it the second layer because the, f the first layer would actually be the rancheros who lived deep in the desert and kind of lived the same way you would expect them to, you would expect to have seen them 100 years ago. Um, then we've got this layer of the missions and the remains of the Spanish pioneers who came. But if we look even deeper, we will see the remains of the people that the Spanish came to convert to Catholicism. Uh, the indigenous Indians of Baja California. And their remnants and the signs of their civilization are all over the valley of the Bujums in the cracks and the crevices, you, but you've got to look really hard to find them. Um, and what's really interesting about these, um, these remnants is that mostly they take the form of rock art and uh, petroglyphs and paintings. And in northern Baja California, there's a very specific type of rock art which you see mostly, which is these abstract geometric forms, which nobody has yet really figured out what they mean. So there's a lot of mysteries in the Valley of the Bujums. Now, as we travel from the Valley of the Bujums just slightly west to the coast, we get to a place that I call the Wild Coast. And really, it's just the Pacific coast of the Valley of the Bujums. But I, for this book, I had to give it its own chapter because it's, it is such an incredible place. Um, and the main thing that characterizes the Wild Coast is simply its isolation and ruggedness. There's very few people. Typically, like I said, you can drive 10, 20, 30 miles at a stretch without seeing anything, maybe a, a tiny little fishing camp. And as you drive down through the Wild Coast, what you'll find are these enormous bluffs, hundreds of feet high, that are guarding the beach and make it very inaccessible and difficult to get down there. And so this is pretty rugged atmosphere. But as we travel even further south, we tend to see that even the bluffs, hundreds of feet high as they are, are dwarfed by these enormous volcanic mesas that arise straight out of the ocean. Uh, so it's a very dramatic kind of environment. Now, I can say that, uh, Omar and I, in the quest for great photography, climbed up this mesa and almost died a couple of times. I don't want to bore you with that story. But um, I, I bring it up to show you the, what we found when we got to the top of this particular mesa, which is several 
enormous shell middens, these pi ancient piles of clams and abalone shells that must have been brought there by the indigenous Indians. And these terminal cliffs at the top of the mesa were just covered with hundreds and hundreds of petroglyphs. So there's a, this rock art is ubiquitous throughout Baja California, not just in the deserts, but even onto the coast. And why these indigenous Indians would hike a thousand feet up from the coast to to uh, to have their shellfish meal is is still is another mystery. Now, as we travel further south, still we'll hit the final uh, the final region, which is the Bahia Sebastian Vizcaino Vizcaino Bay, as it's called. Um, and again, this is something very characteristic of Baja California that as you travel into a slightly different region, everything changes completely not just the geology, but also the, the plant life. So for example, here in Bahia Sebastián Vizcaíno, the bujum trees and the cardón cacti are gone. They're replaced by these enormous forests of Baja California yucca trees, which are very similar to Joshua trees. If you've ever been to Joshua Tree National Park, it's very similar. Um, and the coastline, it transforms from this rugged bluffs and enormous volcanic mesas to a much more gentle coastline with a lot of wetlands and estuaries. And one uh, estuary or, or lagoon in particular is very, is very uh, well known. You can see this lagoon here. It's a, it's a large lagoon that stretches tens of miles inland. It's called Laguna Ojo de Liebre. And I've talked to a few people here that came in earlier that have been to Laguna Ojo de Liebre and experience what it's famous for, which is the fact that gray whales migrate into this lagoon. And it's, a, it's an important refuge for them on their winter migrations up the coast, where you'll sometimes, uh, last year we were there and we saw about 400 uh, mama whales and their calves in the, in the lagoon at one time. It's an incredible place. Finally, as we travel inland from the bay, into the interior of the Vizcaino Desert. Of course, everything changes again and we get to see a whole new version of Baja California. And one thing I wanna mention about the Vizcaino Desert is that, again, there's a lot of rock art of the indigenous people that were there for many years. But now there's a, a transition in rock art that's very evident. Gone are the abstract geometric shapes and we begin to see these uh, enormous humanoid figures that have been coined the great mural style of rock art. So this is the art of a completely different people and probably a much older people. These particular paintings are estimated to be probably at least 7,000 years old. If you're interested further in learning about uh, the rock art of Baja California, probably the seminal work on this topic was done by Harry Crosby. Uh, in the 70s in his, his famous book, Cave Paintings of Baja California. Harry is a, is a, a legend of, of Baja adventure lore and academia. And, I, and believe it or not, Harry's with us tonight here. Where are you, Harry? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> let's give Harry an oh. It's great to have Harry here. He's one of my uh, Baja heroes. One of the things that Harry and I both learned on our, uh, on our trips through Baja California was that in addition to the, the geology, the plant life, and the archaeology, uh, there's one really important remaining element, and that is the people. The people of rural Baja California are just some of the most friendly and interesting people uh, you, can, you can ever meet. And as I said, generous to a fault, uh, beautiful people. Uh, they never cease to leave a smile on my face everywhere we went. So we've traveled through uh, these four regions, which we visited quite a few, uh, uh, quite a few times on our, on our uh, journeys and our research. Um, and we're ending up back in Bahia Vizcaino at Laguna Manuela with the shark fishermen that I worked with for so many years. Uh, so here's a shark fisherman that just came in with his day's catch. And as I mentioned, um, this fisherman again, an amazing guy that uh, was super friendly and had us over to dinner at his house a few times. I had mentioned that there's a lot of human pressure now in Baja California that this is causing many conservation concerns. But at the same time, uh, 
because of all of our work down there, we're learning a lot about how to alleviate or at least begin to address some of these conservation concerns. So in the case of sharks, for example, um, 10 years ago, there were practically no fishing regulations on sharks. And sharks were being caught hand over fist and really being decimated not just on the Pacific coast of Baja, but all over Mexico. And as a result of our research and uh, many other studies around, the, around that country, there are now quite a few fishing regulations. Their fishermen are regulated on how many sharks they can take, what species, what kind of gear they can use, and even what time of year that they can uh, catch those sharks. So there's been a lot of progress made. At Scripps, we are still studying the movements of sharks between Southern California and Mexico. Uh, what you see in this picture is, uh, again, this is a thresher shark, but one of, the, one of the smaller ones. And one of the technologies we're using now to study shark movement patterns is uh, called satellite telemetry. So rather than using a tag where we have to follow the shark for several days on a boat, we now use these satellite tags, which you put on the shark, and you let the shark go, and that's the end of it. What happens is that the data collects, uh, the, sh the tag collects data for six months to a year, however you program it, and at a certain time, it pops off the shark, floats to the surface, and transmits all that data to a satellite. And so I can be sitting in my office and I'll uh, get an email and it will give me the entire life story of that shark for the past year. So it's quite an quite a, uh, effective way of studying sharks, although it is a little bit, of, a little bit expensive. We've been studying primarily juvenile sharks because they're the least studied uh, life history stage of sharks in the Southern California area. So we're studying juvenile threshers, juvenile makos. Here you see one of the smallest blue sharks I ever saw, and we still tagged it with a satellite tag. And it moved to Central Baja, believe it or not. And finally, here's uh, one of our other Scripps researchers, Andy Nosel. Um, if you have ever been swimming around, I think uh, we mentioned leopard shark snorkeling. Leopards are not the only sharks in La Jolla Cove. There's also these sharks called soup fins that are quite common and we'll be out there tomorrow morning. If, if you see us, if you see a little boat in La Jolla Cove, that'll be me tagging uh, soup fins with satellite tags. And the interesting thing about all these sharks that we've been tagging is that if you look at the point A to point B movements of the sharks that we've tracked with this technology, including the blues, the makos, the threshers and the soup fins, we start to see a pretty consistent pattern, and that is that most of these sharks are tagged in Southern California, and they eventually move into Baja, which really confirms the fact that the coastal waters of Baja, California, are a very important migratory pathway for all uh, Northeast Pacific sharks, and that while they're in Baja waters, they're subject to a lot of fishing that we have to keep a uh, good handle on. Another thing that we've discovered that's really interesting is that Bahia Sebastián Vizcaíno, which is where Laguna Manuela is located, actually turns out to be somewhat of a hot spot for sharks. Uh, almost every shark we've tagged either ends up in Bahia Vizcaíno or, or ends up spending a long time in Bahia Sebastián Vizcaíno. And in fact, a recent study of white sharks uh, showed that even great white sharks uh, give birth near Bahia Vizcaíno and use that as a nursery area. And that's critical to their life cycle as well. So there are a lot, we're learning a lot about sharks in Baja, but everything we learn uh, really uncovers a new mystery for us. We will be working in Baja for the next foreseeable decade or two. Um, and while we're studying the sharks of Baja, we will also be doing conservation photography. So uh, we've actually got a little bit of a push here at Scripps. People are starting to recognize that conservation photography is a good way to make people aware of some of these environmental issues. So if you look around at the Birch Aquarium, for example, some of my photography is here, but you'll notice that right here on the wall, there's other uh, underwater photography by another Scripps researcher named Octavio Aburto, who's an incredible underwater photographer. He and I are partnering up for the next project, which is uh, to document the Pacific coast of Baja California Sur, so southern Baja, um, not just above the waterline as I did, but below the waterline as well. Um, and we're uh, presently, we're fundraising for that. We're in, the we're in the philanthropic fundraising stage of that project. So if anyone is interested in, t in uh, getting involved, we really want to make this a Baja community effort. So you can come talk to me afterwards.
But uh, I don't want to get too far in myself and t start talking about the next project because what I'm really excited about right now is the release of the book, Baja's Wild Side, which finally came out just a, about a month ago. Uh, it's been a, a project 10 years in the making, as, as you just learned, and there's a lot of uh, pretty interesting photography in there. I, I'm very proud of that book. The photography's been well received, and in fact, it's, uh, it's presently um, the entire fourth floor of the San Diego Natural History Museum is photography from that book, but blown up really large. So it's a really interesting exhibit. If you get a chance, um, I encourage you to go take a look at it. Um, you can also check out um, the website, BajasWildSide.com, to get information on events and even selling some prints and things like that. Now, uh, just to be as, uh, as a way of ending up here, I want to um, acknowledge a couple of people that were really instrumental in this project. First and foremost, this is Omar Santana, uh, my buddy who I've been working with since 2006 in Baja, California. And we're still working together quite a bit in Baja. He was, he's, he's the guy that uh, made it all possible, really, behind the scenes. Besides him, of course, Dr. Graham was instrumental in many ways that I haven't had a chance to go into. But he, uh, he was super instrumental in setting up many of the partnerships and the funding for these projects. Um, Dr. Oscar Sosa Nishizaki from, from Mexico, other uh, Dr. Davi Kesev, uh, from Scripps, Andy Nosel, and Phil Hastings. Also, Nick Wegner, who's here, did a lot of the shark tracking with me. Uh, but the scientific collaborators are too numerous to mention. I just wanted to keep this to kind of the photography project. Um, Harry Crosby, as I mentioned, is here. And Harry was, uh, was kind enough to meet with me many times and give me his insights into Baja rock art. Graham McIntosh is another legend of Baja uh, uh, adventure writing who wrote the foreword to the book and Sunbelt is the publisher. And I want to make sure I thank uh, the, our funding sources, the Tinker Foundation, UC Mexis, Sea Grant, and Save Our Seas, and particularly the Moore Family Foundation, who's been instrumental in funding our research for over 10 years, which is an incredible thing. So with that, I just want to end by thanking you all for coming. It's been my pleasure to share this adventure with you. And I think we probably have time to, uh, to field a few questions if you haven't. Thank you. So did we ever lose the sharks while we were tracking them with acoustic tags? And if so, how did we ever find them again? Well, I will tell you this, that I am the kind of person that uh, you can ask people. I, I get crazy about that. I have never lost a shark. And I, we had a couple of people that were really a little tough to work with because they'd be, you know, they were volunteers that would come out with us. and they. You'd, you know, you'd, be, you'd come up and say, hey, how's things going? I don't know, I don't really hear it anymore. You'd say, what? <laughs> what do you mean you don't hear it anymore? So uh, that part was actually very difficult. It's hard. It's hard work to follow one of these sharks because especially the large sharks travel fast. And sometimes you're the, it's really windy and wet and cold and you haven't slept in you know, 40 hours or whatever it is. Um, a couple of times. I will say that even I did lose a shark temporarily once. The way you have to find it is by just going around in circles for hours and hoping that you can reacquire the signal. The radius of the signal is only about maybe 1,000 feet. So, you know, and you're out there in the middle of nowhere. I think this, we sometimes got as far out as San Clemente Island. So you can imagine, if you, once you've lost it, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Although uh, we did find a couple after they'd been lost by other people. <laughs> Just basically asking, uh, after Bahia Sebastián Vizcaíno, these sharks that we're ta uh, tracking with satellite tags, do they go past that area? Or where else do they go do they, on these uh, enormous migrations? And when we first started tracking with threshers with satellite tags, um, we were under the assumption, the commonly held assumption, that threshers as a species generally move south into Baja waters in the winter when it's warmer, and then they migrate north in the, in the summer. And that was the commonly held belief about threshers um, in any textbook you would read. Uh, and we really thought we would see that. And it turns out that so far, we, that actually hasn't borne out. Part of the reason for that is because we're, we're studying baby threshers that live very close to the coast. And it turns out that 
um, the coastal waters of northern Baja can actually be substantially colder than the coastal waters of Southern California because of a phenomenon called upwelling, where cold, deep water comes up to the coast. So that kind of confounds things a little bit. Even in the middle of uh, winter, the water, the water might be warmer uh, you know, in northern California than it is down in Baja. But the other part of the story is that um, I, I didn't mention this, but we did another study of the artisanal fishing camps of Baja, not this part, but Baja Sur. So that was another two-year study where we visited all the fishing camps of southern Baja. And guess how many thresher sharks we found in those fishing camps? Two in all of those years. So it turns out that this point that juts out of the center of Baja California, of the peninsula, that's called the Vizcaino Peninsula, and it turns out that that peninsula is really important in the oceanography of the region. Cold waters that are coming from the north get deflected off into the Pacific, and tropical waters coming from the south get deflected. So what you generally have is a very cool waters in this region and very warm waters in, in that region. And so that kind of dictates the kind of species that you're going to see there. So thresher sharks, particularly juvenile threshers, don't tr they travel down to this point and no further. And they travel pretty much up to this point, point conception, and a little bit beyond. That seems to be their primary range. So how, th how deep did thre do thresher sharks dive? Um, Obviously, when the juveniles are on the continental shelf, they can't go very deep because the, it's only 100 meters deep to start with. Um, but once they get off that shelf, we measured dives of typically three to 400 meters. Now, that's not to say that that's as deep as they go because we were studying these sharks with acoustic telemetry, which means we could only follow them for a couple of days at a time. I have not tagged those bigger sharks with, uh, with satellite tags yet. So we don't know, but it's very likely that those adult sharks probably make much deeper dives. And, when, and it turns out when you study sharks with satellite telemetry, because you can track them for 180 days instead of two days, uh, you really get to find that out. And I wouldn't be surprised if thresher sharks went up down to 1,000 meters as we have seen with many other shark species. Now in terms of what happens with the meat, that the of the sharks that are caught in the fishing camps, um, actually most of it is used lo is consumed locally. So in in Baja California on the Pacific coast, the fishermen are organized into cooperatives. They each have their own turf, and those and the and the cooperatives kind of uh, ha each uh, regulate how they deal with the, the the fish and the product. But basically, they process it locally and sell it locally. In some cases where it's a more lucrative uh, species, like mako shark, for example, is actually quite an expensive shark. Here, they're sold here for $7 a pound. And uh, those might be sold to the United States. But if you've ever been to Baja, who's ever been to Baja and had a fish taco? <laughs> you've probably eaten a shark or, or a stingray. Uh, because that's what most of the, the fish tacos are made of because they don't they don't use the ex the more expensive fish for fish tacos But you know anything that's been deep-fried in oil tastes pretty good <laughs>